Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, it's my absolute pleasure to be uh, invited at this prestigious meeting with more than 1,000 uh, participants to speak about the surgery uh, against the ART. However, pleading pro surgery at the EV Congress, it's a task for fearless guys or madmen. However, I will try to argue why a well-done surgical treatment prior to ART in a majority of patients with deep endometriosis and pregnancy wish may be a valuable option. And in my presentation, I will focus on colorectal deep endometriosis. Why? Because it is the most frequent of severe form of deep endometriosis. And we have a myriad of publications uh, which allow us to uh, draw some uh, conclusions. So, my lecture does not concern endometrioma surgery. I want to emphasize that I was among the first surgeons who observed that the excision of endometriomas is harmful for the ovarian reserve. And as back as 2009, I completely stopped to perform cystectomy in endometriomas in women who intend to get pregnant. So I won't focus on, uh, on uh, this uh, topic where I agree with you that the, the surgery may not be uh, useful. So I, I, will, I will focus on this particular situation that you know very, very well, where a young woman, let's say a 30 year old Nulipara, stops the pill to get pregnant. And after a couple of months, she has some symptoms which prompt the diagnosis of deep endometriosis infiltrating the rectum. So the general practitioner refers her to a physician and the physician asks, too frequently, asks her, what is your priority? Relieving pain or getting pregnant? And the answer, of course, is getting pregnant because the patient had the time to look at the internet and to see that the endometriosis may lead to infertility. So she's scared by the, by the um, possibility to be infertile. So the doctor will say, well, you need first one or several IVF, and then we'll see. But I think that the question itself is wrong, because it suggests that the two goals, to relieve pain and to get pregnant, cannot be accomplished at the same time. And this is completely wrong. Far from more, she stopped the pill a couple of months ago, so we have no evidence that she's actually infertile. So the question is, does she need an IVF? However, my colleague who saw the patient bases his conviction on guidelines, on ASHRAE guidelines, um, and uh, everybody knows that we have no randomized control trial comparing the surgery to IVF, so no definitive conclusion can be provided uh, favorable to the surgery or to the IDF. That's why the conclusion of the ESHRA group was that the effectiveness of surgical excision of deep endometriosis before the treatment or with assisted reproductive technologies is not well established to be, uh, to be useful. So it is not routinely recommended. However, the group emphasized that women with deep endometriosis often suffer from pain requiring surgical treatment. So, surgery would a priori not improve fertility rates when the IVF is mandatory. But is, is it really mandatory? As regards the recommendation to take care about the pain of, of, of patients, I, I do not completely agree because, in my opinion, the symptoms are much more important than the pain. Because in deep endometriosis, we have numerous symptoms which are more important than the pelvic pain. For example, the deep dyspareunia. Young women cannot have sexual intercourse. This is a major symptom, however, it is not a pelvic pain. Dysuria. Dysuria for me, it's a catastrophical symptoms because it, it means that deep endometriosis uh, 
involves the splatnik nurse. So there is a huge risk that this young woman requires self-catheterization for the whole life. It is not pain. Dysuria is not painful. Blotting. Blotting is not a painful syndrome symptom. However, it may, uh, it may um, be the consequence of huge endometriosis involving the colon and there is an actual risk of bowel occlusion. Every year I managed several patients with subocclusion and also with occlusion which had a stoma elsewhere. It is not a rare symptom. Silent kidney. When you have deep endometriosis involving the ureter, the patient may lose the kidney without having pain. Uh, kidney atrophy is not painful, so you have not to expect to have pain because you may find a silent kidney. Sacral roots or sciatic pain. There's not a pelvic pain. There's a, pelvi it's a pain in the buttock and in the leg. So it's not need to refer the patient for osteopathy or kinesiotherapy. There is deep endometriosis which irritates or infiltrates the sacral roots. The surgery is most challenging, so it's not time to, uh, to delay it. But let's say that our patient is just a little painful and she wants to get pregnant. So the question is what she can expect depending on each strategy, surgery or IVF. And we have some evidence to answer her what, what is the probability of pregnancy if she has IVF or surgery. And let's start by IVF. So if we leave the endometriosis behind and we refer it for, uh, we refer her for IVF, she can expect up to 68% of pregnancies. And this data comes from a, an article, a study of Marcos Ballester, a friend of me uh, in Paris. He prospectively follow up 75 patients with colorectal endometriosis who underwent IVF. And he observed that 43 of them conceived and he estimated that if all the patients had had free IVF cycles, the pregnancy rate would have reached 68%. So 68% is the best we have seen. Now let's see what result we can expect, what result we can expect if we propose the surgery. So the pregnancy rate is not up to 71% as written here, but 81%. So here you have a, a study, a, a review of the literature reported by Nicolao Berlanda from Milano. And the authors pulled together several series of patients with uh, a deep endometriosis. And they concluded that if you perform the surgery, you can expect 25%, 24% of natural conception, which are due to the surgery itself. And now I will present you some results from our database because uh, since 2009, all the patients I have managed for endometriosis were, have been enrolled in a prospective database. And I have a clinical researcher who is, who is paid to only manage this database and to send to patients follow-up questionnaires one, three, five, seven, and nine years after the surgery. So I had a good idea about what has happened with my patients. And here you have a study published in 2015 in Human Reproduction where I tried to see whether or not performing the colorectal surgery in patients with endometriomas impairs the results in terms of pregnancy. So all the patients in this area had ovarian endometriomas, uh, which were treated by ablation, vaporization using plasma energy, so no cystectomy in this series, and a half of them had colorectal endometriosis, which was cured. And I observed that the probability to get pregnant was 74% three years after the surgery, and I actually, actually saw 66% of pregnancy rate, and the majority of them were spontaneous conceptions. And if you look at the Kaplan-Meier 
survival, uh, survival curve, you can see that the performing the colorectal surgery, in addition to the ovarian surgery, did not change the probability of, po of post-operative pregnancy. Some patients from Rouen, from my, uh, from my center, were pulled to some patient to, uh, to, uh, from uh, Tenon Hospital in Paris, and Marcos Ballester performed a retrospective study to check the results of the IVF in patients with previous colorectal surgery. And he observed pregnancy rate 60% in patients with operated colorectal endometriosis. And he estimated 78% of pregnancy rate if all the patient has free IVF. And he observed that the conservative surgery, meaning that we, we try to avoid the segmental colorectal resection and we try to perform a conservative surgery by shaving or disc excision, so limited surgery on the bowel, as well as uh, fast ART management or the two factors which increased the rate of pregnancies. And here is my, my major study. It's a, the first and the unique randomized trial comparing two surgeries for, for large colorectal endometriosis. So there are patients with symptomatic colorectal endometriosis, large colorectal endometriosis, which are randomized between segmental resection of the rectum, and shaving or disc excision, meaning conservative surgery. So the main outcome was not the fertility, but as the, the trial was randomized, the patient was cur were carefully followed up for years. And now we have six to uh, six years of follow-up. And we could observe that four years after the surgery, after the primary surgery, 81% of patients were pregnant, with a majority of pregnancies spontaneous, natural conception. And if you look at only infertile patients with preoperative conception failure for longer than 12 months, you observe that these patients were pregnant in 74% of cases, and again, in infertile patients, the surgery allowed a majority of, of uh, conceptions spontaneously. And we, I, I try also to understand whether or not, after the surgery, if I refer the patient directly to the IVF, the, the conception is, uh, is faster. Because, you know, in, in, in daily practice, uh, we, we can say, oh, the patient should be uh, pregnant uh, quickly, so uh, we refer uh, her for uh, IVF. What you observe that at the end of the surgery, when I said I used the endometriosis fertility index, and each time I said to the patient, go to spontaneous conception, the patient had the probability to be pregnant earlier than the patient who are referred to IVF. Why? Because to have an IVF, you have to, you have to, uh, um, to encounter the, SAR, the, um, the physician, there is a preoperative, uh, the pre-IVF uh, uh, consultation. So there are some delays which uh, postpone uh, the IVF, and uh, you know that the first IVF is not always uh, successful. So we observe that spontaneous conception is faster in patients where the surgeon said you can you can try a spontaneous conception. Now, <clears throat> let's compare the situation where the patient is referred to the primary IVF versus primary surgery in studies where there were two arms of patients with each one of these strategies. And we have such studies, and the most beautiful is the best is that of Paolo Bianchi from Sao Paulo. It was published 10 years ago. And Paolo Bianchi enrolled patients with rectovaginal endometriosis, and the patient chose themselves whether or not they want to have a surgery versus IVF. And it's a pity that he did not randomize the patient, because I think that the debate would have been closed today. So, the patient chose between IVF and surgery, and this is a confounding factor because we do not, we do not know why they choose the surgery versus IVF. Uh, 
We do not want, we do not know whether or not they were more severe in the surgical arm or in the IVF arm. But at the end of the trial, enrolling only patients with surgery and IVF versus patients with IVF without surgery, Paolo Bianchi observed that the pregnancy rate after IVF was better when the surgery uh, preceded IVF. However, I call him and I ask him to look at his database and to add the patient, to, to identify the patients who had a spontaneous conception after the surgery or uh, before the IVF. And these patients were excluded from the study. And he checks the data and he found that the spontaneous pregnancy rate in his database outside the article published in 2009 was 8% in the arm IVF, which is normal because uh, stage 4 endometriosis, the probability of spontaneous pregnancy is uh, about uh, 8 to 10%. And 21% after the surgery, meaning that if we pull together the patients with IVF, surgery, IVF, and surgery, uh, spontaneous conception, we may see 29% of pregnancies if we propose, if the patient chooses IVF, versus 51% if the patient chooses surgery followed by IVF. The difference is significant. And now another study where um, <clears throat> we pulled together the patients from Paris and uh, from my center in Rouen, and we tried to perform a, a propensity score. It's a kind of uh, a false randomization because uh, retrospectively you choose the patient who had similar uh, characteristics. And we compared surgery uh, versus uh, IVF surgery and IVF versus IVF, and we observed that surgery and IVF provides better results than IVF alone. Now, you will see, okay, you perform the surgery, but the surgery of deep endometriosis is complicated, so you, ha you may have complications in young women. I agree with you. The question is whether or not the risk of postoperative complications may balance the advantage of postoperative spontaneous conception. And if you look at the literature, in, you can see that the rate of postoperative complication is not as scary as uh, it seems. Because the rectovaginal fistula may occur in 2 to 3%, but we can repair it. The leakage, less than 1%. Ureteral fistula, 1%. So all this complication may be managed within six months to one year. And they concern only a minority, minority of uh, patients. And this is all, uh, always my um, experience in my own database, because uh, to date I have managed more than 850 patients with colorectal endometriosis, and the rate of rectovaginal fistula and leakage is inferior to 3%. And these results should be put into the, in the mirror with 65, 71, 81% of pregnancies after the surgery. Far from more, the patient had the endometriosis removed. And we also try to understand whether or not the patients with postoperative complications uh, have the fertility definitively impaired, and we pulled together patients from my center, from Lille Center, and from Paris, and we observed that in 48 women with severe complications requiring a second surgery, the pregnancy rate five to six years after the surgery was 42%, and the majority of them were spontaneous. So I think that the risk of complication, postoperative complication, does not balance the benefit of the surgery on spontaneous conception and maybe, maybe on the conception by IVF after the surgery. Now, let's turn the situation on the other side. Let's ask ourselves if repeated IVF procedures in patients with unoperated endometriosis are always safe. We have a paper in uh, review 
in uh, re revision in review in human reproduction, where I, I in enrolled 43 patients. I saw in my consultation during one year, and all the patients had at least two MRI without surgery between the two MRI. And the two MRI should have at least one year uh, apart. And I checked whether or not the patient uh, had uh, IVF or tried to get pregnant. And I observed that 40% of patients who had not, who were not in amenorrhea during the period between the two MRI had an obvious progression of the nodule, of the colorectal nodule. And when I say obvious progression, to, to state the progression, we, um, we choose to have uh, an increase of at least one centimeter of the nodule, meaning that uh, in some patients the, the nodule increased by 50%. So 40% of patients without amenorrhea and a uh, rectovaginal nodule, a rectal nodule, may see their, uh, their, no, uh, their nodule growing. And what does it change? But everything may change. Because performing the surgery later in bigger nodule may change completely the functional outcomes and the result of the surgery. Expecting the surgery, the patients may have occlusion, kidney loss, self-catheterization, performing the surgery on very big nodules infiltrating the vagina increase dramatically increase the risk of rectovaginal fistula and the nerve infiltration is followed by neuropathic pain which are not solved by the surgery. So good surgeons can do challenging surgery. We can remove the endometriosis. However, the price to pay by the patient in terms of functional outcomes and complications rate is not the same. Sometime when I manage the patients with big, deep endometriosis with previous IVF, I ask myself how my colleague who performed the IVF could reach the ovary with the needle without injuring the rectum. So it is very, in some cases, I do not understand how you, how you can do to, to, to reach the follicles. Because the, the pelvis is frozen and the, um, the rectum is between the vagina and the, and the ovaries. And just to, 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 to recall the case of one patient, a 26-year nulipara, Six unsuccessful IVF prior the surgery, one peritonitis open surgery, one homoperitoneum following the puncture, second laparotomy, and then I had to perform a very challenging surgery in a subocclusion of the bowel. The result of the surgery was not good at all. Now, the take home message. So, I'm not a crazy man. I try to be a fair scientist. I know that all of you here, you, you know many patients whose fertility was dramatically destroyed by surgery. So I know that the data in the, in the literature, which are reported by experienced team, are not the same you see in the daily real life. That's why I try to moderate my, uh, my presentation, and the goal is to emphasize that there is no randomized trial to state that IVF should be done in, in deep endometriosis versus surgery. I try to emphasize that I agree we have a negative impact of the surgery of endometriomas on the fertility, on the ovarian reserve, but not this does not concern the deep endometriosis surgery. That we have enough data to think that the total pregnancy rate is probably higher after deep endometriosis surgery with or without IVF than IVF alone. That natural pregnancy rate is definitively higher after the surgery. And, of course, there are some benefits in terms of pain, surgical outcomes, and reduction of health expenses. Now, what I, what I expect, my, my final message for you, 
is that if you see in consultation for infertility a patient with deep endometriosis, my advice is to perform a complete deep endometriosis assessment, MRI, endorectal ultrasound, CT scan, everything you need to understand the extent of this disease. To ask an advice to an experienced surgeon, an experienced deep endometriosis surgeon, in order to have a valuable advice about the feasibility of the surgery and the risk related to uh, postponing of the surgery. Keep in mind that the patients with deep endometriosis are very heterogeneous, so you cannot provide guidelines, definitive guidelines. So it's a custom-made management. And don't forget, patients with deep endometriosis, there is a benefit to give them a continuous pill between two or three IVF procedures. They do not, do not need to have periods, because the periods may lead to the growth of the nodule. And final message, try to do not push your luck too far with the IVF in unoperated patients in order to avoid complications. Thank you very much.